So thank, thanks everybody for joining. I'm Jack Deslip. I lead the application performance group here at NERSC. And um, I'm going to kind of give you an overview of the Perlmutter system itself and uh, some of the capabilities of the GPU and some of what we've been doing to work with, with users and, and what we've learned um, from that from that process, just to kind of give you a little bit of a kickoff to the day on the potential of Perlmutter. Um, so I want to start with this uh, overview slide of where kind of Perlmutter um, sits in our in our roadmap. So back in uh, 2013, we deployed what is now kind of like the last of maybe like a traditional or like what was a multi-decade kind of trend of HPC systems that were dominated by um, CPUs, like server-class server CPUs in a distributed um, uh, kind of massively parallel system. And uh, I think what we kind of realized at the time is that to continue meeting the capability requirements of our of our user community, we we're gonna have to move towards um, kind of more energy efficient architectures as we make this transition towards exascale. And so with the Cori system, we procured uh, for the first time kind of like a novel architecture based on the Intel Xeon Phi technology. And with Perlmutter, we're kind of continuing this transition with our first ever GPU accelerated uh, system at, at NERSC. And this is part of the roadmap that should lead to um, our first sort of exascale class system in the 2025-2026 timeframe. So here is kind of a picture of the Perlmutter system configuration. There are two types of, of nodes in the system. Actually, there are kind of like three types of nodes in the system. But two big categories. So one are the GPU accelerated nodes, and then there are, in addition, still um, some CPU um, CPU only, only nodes as well. So um, a lot of the capability of the system comes from these GPU accelerated nodes, the NVIDIA Ampere GPU, GPU nodes. Um, each one has four GPUs in it. Um, and one uh, of the AMD Milan CPUs. Um, each GPU has um, 40 gigabytes of, of HBM. And uh, in addition, there's a traditional D DRAM on the system. And each one has four uh, connections to the interconnect, so four, four individual uh, network interface cards or, 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 or NICs. Um, and then for the CPU only nodes, we have two CPUs per node with one, uh, one connection to the interconnect on uh, each, each, one of those, um, each one of those nodes. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more details of, of these as we, as we go through the slides here. Um, so overall, the system has uh, the following specifications. So there's the GPU nodes. And one of the things I kind of uh, skipped on the last slide is that there's actually two different types. So the majority of those have the 40 gigabytes of HBM per GPU. Uh, but we additionally have 256 nodes with, um, a, with a uh, sort of a little bit of a higher skew on the GPU that has 80 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory uh, or HBM per, per GPU as well as the 3,000 um, CPU, CPU only nodes. Um, in terms of the performance, you can see um, quite a lot of the performance comes from the GPU, uh, GPU nodes in terms of the actual like available flops or floating point instructions um, on, the, on the system. And uh, the, CPU, the CPU only partition though, um, one of the things I will highlight is that it's a you know close in um, capability to that of of Cori. So um, all of the Cori system is uh, similar in capability to the to the CPU nodes of uh, of Perlmutter. 
Um, so this is kind of a diagram of what I was describing earlier. So here's what a GPU node looks like. You have these uh, four A100 GPUs, um, one AMD Milan CPU, and it is connected to four network interface cards or four NICs that connect it to the um, overall Perlmutter network. Uh, one thing to, to also highlight is that the A100s themselves are connected via NVLink to each other. So there's a very high speed network between the four GPUs on the, on the node that is described here. Um, the GPUs themselves are connected to the, to the node or to the, to the CPU via um, a PCI Express uh, 4 connection. Um, and uh, one of the things that, uh, of course, makes the GPUs very capable is their high bandwidth memory. So each of these cards has at least 40 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory. I talked about the fact that we have 256, 256 additional nodes with uh, 80 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory. And that's called high bandwidth memory because the bandwidth between uh, the memory and like the, the GPU registers and compute units is very high. It's uh, over 1500 gigabytes a second, which I'm highlighting sort of right here. Um, and that's compared to the kind of similar bandwidth on the CPU of, of about 200 uh, gigabytes per second of CPU, um, CPU memory. Um, all right, so each of these GPUs uh, is a very capable processing unit. And so um, it's capable of up to um, about 10, uh, 10 teraflops each it, at the kind of 64 bit or double, double precision level. Um, but if you actually are able to use the tensor cores, um, which is like matrix matrix type, mul multiply type operations, you can get about double the performance um, out, of the, out of the A100 GPUs. Okay, and then over here, I have a diagram of the CPU nodes uh, where we have two AMD Milan processors per node um, there's 64 cores per CPU. So each of these AMD Milans has 64 cores, which is um, convenient because it's uh, kind of similar in spirit to um, the KNL, uh, the, the KNL nodes that we have on Cori. Um, it supports up to the AVX2 instruction set. So this is actually about half, it's half the vector width of the, the KNLs on Cori, um, but it has um, a very capable um, uh, CPU cores, um, quite uh, quite a lot faster than um, each of the the, the KNL cores that you'd find on Cori. Um, in addition, as I said, it sports up to about 200 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Um, and um, you can see a few other um, stats uh, for each of the, the CPUs below. Um, one of the exciting aspects, I think, about Perlmutter is the fact that we have this old flash file system on the system. So the Scratch file system is all flash. It's about 35 petabytes of disk space. It has an aggregate bandwidth of over five terabytes a second. Um, and because it's flash, it's really um, performing well in terms of IOPS, so 4 million um, IOPS uh, per, uh, per second. Um, and, uh, you know, this at, at, at the end of the day, underneath the file system are these about 4,000 um, NVMe SSDs that are powering the performance. So unlike Cori, where you have a kind of a disk-based scratch and then a burst buffer uh, layer that is flash-based, um, here at Perlmutter, the, the kind of story is a bit simplified. You just have one scratch file system, and it's all, all flash. Um, 
And so one of the things that I want to kind of chat about today with uh, all of you and kind of um, present is that we really kind of have this common challenge together with, uh, with you all in the user community, which is to enable this diverse community of scientific uh, codes to you know, run efficiently on um, an advanced architecture like Perlmutter, starting kind of with the Cori transition and beyond as we look towards Exascale. Um, and you can see some, a little bit of uh, the difference between Perlmutter and Cori as we continue this transition in this table here. Um, so obviously the peak performance of the system has gone up quite quite a bit. Um, and uh, we're looking at increased capabilities in um, a number of different, uh, different avenues. So of course the memory, the overall system memory has gone up, but one of the most significant differences is this node performance number, which has gone up quite significantly due largely to the fact that we have these uh, uh, GPU power nodes with um, the A100 GPUs. Um, and um, one of the things that we looked at as we um, sort of began this process of deploying Perlmutter is what fraction of the uh, workload is really kind of ready for for GPUs. And so this was the situation kind of back in the 2017, 2018 timeframe where we looked at um, the, the major codes at NERSC that were using the most hours and, and sort of how ready they were for, for GPUs. And so this was the categorization that we used. And this is one of the reasons why um, we ended up with a system that has both GPU accelerated nodes, but also some CPU uh, CPU only nodes is because we found that um, while a large fraction of our workload uh, had been enabled um, or could be enabled, um, uh, you know, parts of the workload were, were, were also not yet um, optimized for for GPUs, and so that kind of motivated us to start a um, an effort to really help our our users and partner with the user community to um, increase the number of applications that were um, optimized and enabled for the for the GPUs. And so, what I'm going to tell you is a little bit about some of what we did there and what we've learned and what we hope we can continue doing with uh, with you all. So we started this program called NESAP, which stands for the NERSC Exascale Science Application Program. And you know, part of the motivation was that there is some significant work or differences that have to um, be taken into account as you um, uh, consider optimizing your application for a GPU. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of those differences over the next few slides. So one of the biggest differences is just the amount of parallelism that's required. So if you look at a typical uh, CPU, uh, CPU node from Cori um, using the, the Intel Haswell architecture, um, you can see that there are 64 cores per node. Uh, with the Intel hyper-threading technology, you can sort of have two threads uh, really active at each time. Um, it has an AVX2 instruction set. So, you, so at the, at the um, sort of CPU level, you can have two by 256 bit vectors. So um, this is sort of four wide if you're, if you're talking about um, uh, double precision um, numbers. And so if you do all the math here, you can en end up with 2000 uh, way parallelism that's really required to keep one of those CPU nodes on, um, on uh, Cori kind of fully occupied and fully busy um, 
every every cycle. If you compare this with the GPUs or the A100s uh, on Perlmutter, you kind of have the equivalent of 108 SM. So SM stands for streaming multiprocessor, which is not quite the same, but we can maybe make like a rough comparison to like a core on, um, on Cori. Uh, each of those SMs can support up to 64 warps uh, at a time. Um, so two are active at a time, but you really want to kind of oversubscribe things to keep the GPU busy so you can have up to 64. Um, and one of the biggest differences is that each one of those warps uh, really works on 32 SIMD lanes um, at a time. And so if you do the math here, you end up with 108 times 64 times 32. So that's 200,000 way parallelism. So that's a big leap from, uh, uh, from the 2000 way parallelism of the of the CPU that we were talking about on Haswell. Um, and yeah, so this, this bullet just describes what I was saying in words is that you typically want to oversubscribe the GPU to keep, uh, to keep it busy. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why you end up with the in increased parallelism. <clears throat> um, so it did, another concept that's really important for the, for the, uh, to understand the performance of the GPU is around memory bandwidth. So um, on the kind of Corey Haswell nodes, you have 128 gigabytes of this D of kind of tr traditional DDR DRAM. Um, and it is capable of 128 gigabytes a second. So that basically means it can bring in 100 gigabytes every second uh, of data from memory uh, into the CPU or in, sort of into the registers of the CPU to do computing. Um, on the GPU nodes of Perlmutter, so we're considering a single A100 GPU here, we have 40 gigabytes of HBM on most of the nodes. Some of the nodes do have 80 gigabytes. Um, and you see that you have 1500 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, so or, over an order of magnitude higher than those Haswell CPUs on, uh, on Cori. Um, and so that uh, gives you an, a lot of capability, but one of the complications is that uh, the connection between the CPU and the GPU is relatively slow. Um, so that's powered by this PCI Express um, uh, bus here. And you can see that's about 32 gigabytes a second. So much, much smaller than the bandwidth that's available uh, from, G from the GPU memories to the GPU compute units. And so one of the challenges is that you want to try to avoid moving memory uh, or, or data kind of back and forth between the CPU and the GPU as infrequently as, uh, as possible. And so one of the challenges of uh, optimizing for the GPU is that there are kind of multiple optimization avenues that you uh, typically want to pursue. So um, I've highlighted kind of two of them so far. So you, one of them is the expressing more parallelism in your application. Uh, a second is making use of the uh, very fast memory on the GPU, but also realizing that moving data between the GPU and CPU is, is not fast. Um, and then there are other sort of higher order considerations that you'll want to consider like, um, you know, every time you launch a piece of work or kernel on the GPU, uh, there can be some overhead. And so you want to try to make that work. Um, in, in general as long and um, uh, significant as possible. So sometimes you wanna kind of fuse shorter kernels together. Um, and uh, even though that the high bandwidth memory is fast on the GPUs, there's still um, an opportunity to use things like the registers or the cache or shared memory on the GPU to get even faster. Um, performance. Um, so we kind of realized that this was a, uh, 
a kind of challenging um, uh, sort of activity for uh, the community. And so one of the things that we worked with NVIDIA on is sort of providing tools that get you um, a lot of information about your code that is actually actionable and can help tell you which of these uh, optimization directions you can move in. And so uh, Insight by NVIDIA is a, kind of a new performance tool that includes some additional um, uh, functionality based on our conversations and relationships with them. And so one of what one of the new uh, features that they provide in that tool is a roof line analysis um, application. And so uh, what this can tell you is sort of where your application falls on a uh, roofline plot, which I'm showing here, which kind of characterizes your applications in terms of its data movement versus uh, overall performance and against a ceiling. And it can kind of tell you which directions you might look to optimize your application in. Um, so overall, what we've done with the NISAP program is to partner with a set of application development teams, uh, along with our vendor partners like uh, NVIDIA and Cray HPE, um, to work with them to prepare their codes for Perlmutter at a pretty deep level. And what we like to do now is kind of share those lessons learned with, with uh, with the greater nurse community, kind of you all that are attending this training um, and let you know uh, some of the opportunities to continue working, working with us. And so we selected about 25 applications across the simulation data and learning spaces. Um, and uh, it was sort of an all hands on deck activity. Here are some of the staff members that participated. Um, a number of them will be um, available uh, to kind of chat throughout the, throughout the day today and are participating in the, uh, the hands-on sessions. Um, and one of the things that I really want to highlight to, uh, to you all today is uh, an opportunity that still is ongoing. So these um, one of the most fruitful activities that we um, uh, that we kind of engaged in as part of the NISA program is uh, these hackathons, um, and we had kind of had two different types of hackathons. So one was sort of private hackathons that were part of our uh, contract to deliver Perlmutter. Uh, but secondly, is completely public hackathons that uh, you can find for yourselves if you go to this website, gpuhackathons.org. Um, and these are hackathons that occur almost on like a monthly basis all over the country um, and are really led by uh, NVIDIA itself. Um, and NERSC, I think, has provided more team members than any other institution to these worldwide events over the last couple of years. Um, we are hosting one ourselves uh, upcoming later this year. You can find the information at gpuhackathons.org. Uh, and these are open for anyone um, with an application that they want to uh, help, uh, they want help with uh, GPU optimizations on. Um, and I think what this is doing is it's allowing us to reach kind of nurse teams that are all around the country, kind of really actually all around the world, and to help amplify the NISAP program. So um, probably if I have one takeaway, <laughs> one takeaway from my talk here today is to go check out this link, gpuhackathons.org, um, and uh, consider participating uh, yourselves in one of these upcoming upcoming hackathons. So we're going to have kind of like a hands-on session later later today. Um, and maybe that'll give you kind of like a taste for what you can kind of accomplish in a kind of
kind of a more deep dive type um, uh, event like one of these uh, one of these hackathons. Um, okay, so I want to then kind of talk about some of what is possible to accomplish. So through our partnership with uh, different applications, partly at these sort of like hackathon events, uh, we worked with a bunch of different code teams on improving their performance on GPU. So one of those code teams was LAMPS. Uh, so LAMPS is a classical molecular dynamics code. It has sort of a focus on materials modeling. Um, and uh, there's a production version of LAMPS that uses uh, Cocos, which is sort of how they're accessing the, the GPU. If you don't know what Cocos is, that's, a, that's okay. It's just kind of like a GPU um uh sort of fra framework um and it had already sort of been optimized uh via kind of a relationships with the with the vendors uh but what they found is that going to these hackathons in particular and looking at the kernels that were their computational bottlenecks that there was opportunity to kind of rewrite these for the GPUs and um, get additional performance. So in particular, you can see here kind of like the speed up over time, I think starting with a value of one here um, and progressing over time as they worked towards optimizing their application for Perlmutter. In particular, you can see these hackathons um, are places where they made significant progress very quickly. Um, these near vertical bars are those, those hackathons. Um, and uh, they ended up finding that there was lots and lots of kind of uh, performance that could be gained by um, tuning the, the code for the, for the GPU, for the GPU architecture. Um, and this actually led to some really Nice, uh, nice scientific results um, that were um, uh, finalists for the this Gordon Bell Prize at the supercomputing conference, and uh, really represents the the largest ever um, molecular dynamics simulations uh, to date with this sort of fidelity up to twenty billion atom calculations. Um, one of the things that you can see here is the performance in terms of like million atom steps per second. And uh, what would be ideal here is for the code to have a flat, a flat curve um, on this plot where you scale, uh, you scale up the problem and the number of GPUs used at the same time. Um, you can see that they're comparing the performance on the summit computer at uh, um, Oak, Oak Ridge National Lab and then uh, Perlmutter as well as the kind of an internal uh, NVIDIA cluster. And the difference between these two curves here uh, is essentially coming from the difference of generations of GPU. So the summit system has a V100 or Volta GPU, whereas these two systems, including Perlmutter, have the newer A100 GPUs. And so you can see that the difference in the GPU generation is essentially giving but a factor of 1.6 uh, or higher performance uh, in, increase. Um, and so uh, this has kind of been part of a series of large scale calculations that have come out of the NISAP program that have been kind of highlighted at supercomputing as part of this Gordon Bell um, uh, prize series. Um, and uh, we're happy to say that one of our NISAP teams, including one of the nurse staff members was a winner of the prize in, uh, in 2022. So this is using the warp X code um, and uh, you can see other NISAP applications have been able to really accomplish some great large scale science um, outcomes as well. Uh, so in terms of overall optimizations, I would say that um, the good news is that we've seen that many applications have been successful 
uh, preparing for Perlmutter. And um, we think that what we've learned can be uh, kind of applied to other applications as well. And one of the ways that we'd like to keep engaging with the broader nurse community is through training events like today, uh, but also if you think that you could benefit from a deeper dive with nurse staff and with experts from like NVIDIA um, uh, at your side, then we really encourage everyone to join these community hackathons at gpuhackathons.org. Um, and there's events kind of all over the country in the, in the upcoming six months in the upcoming year that you can um, consider joining. Um, you know, one of the things I highlighted that is that um, there are multiple kind of GPU optimizations that exist. And so I'll, one of the things that we really highlight at these events is kind of profiling and analyzing your application to determine kind of which optimization paths make the, are, are likely to be the most profitable for your application. Um, and I'm going to switch gears a little bit over the next few slides, just to kind of talk about the capability of the system itself and some of the configuration. Um, one of the things that I want to highlight is that uh, Perlmutter kind of supports every GPU programming model out there. If you've um, been following a little bit about what's going on in like Oak Ridge and Argonne, they're, they're also deploying really large scale um, GPU systems um, powered by AMD GPUs or Intel GPUs. And um, they tend to support some subset of this chart, but because Perlmutter is based on um, kind of like the um, maybe longest turn, the longest uh, standing kind of GPU computing vendor, uh, we essentially support uh, all of the existing GPU uh, programming models. And so we kind of took a practical point of view that um, we know the community, uh, the nurse community has existing GPU applications that may be built with CUDA, uh, OpenACC, um, even CUDA, CUDA Fortran. Um, and we really want to kind of meet you where you are. And those are all enabled on Cori, uh, sorry, on Perlmutter. Um, but uh, we also recognize that things like performance portability, the ability to run both at NERSC and other DOE uh, facilities and also other HPC facilities around the world is important to our community. And so one of the things that we worked on with, with uh, NVIDIA is making sure that there's a performance portable path forward uh, using uh, OpenMP which was something that we highlighted a lot for Corey as a way to get the most performance out of the system. Um, and so that's been enabled on uh, Perlmutter uh, as well through NRE that we, uh, NRE stands for kind of like a work contract that we um, drove with, uh, with NVIDIA. Uh, in addition, if you are working on porting your applications to those systems at Oak Ridge and Argonne, um, we do support DPC++ uh, execution on the system, uh, as well as HIP. I think you can see on this plot, HIP is supported, um, as well as very popular C++ frameworks like Cocos for um, uh, getting the most uh, performance portably on a system using sort of C++ applications. Um, so the, the system really does have a, have a pretty robust programming in, environment. And this includes things uh, even in the data and analytics space. Um, so we've done a lot to make sure Python um, is, is optimized for, for Perlmutter. Uh, definitely things like uh, TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch are enabled for uh, AI and machine learning. 
Um, and we've deployed the Rapids stack on, on the system as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about Jupyter in a second. Um, and the, a lot of the same debuggers and uh, profilers are available on the system that you may be used to from, from past systems. So that includes DDT um, and Craypat. And then uh, NVIDIA, as I kind of highlighted earlier, provides a very useful set of GPU profiling tools uh, based on the Insight profiling package. Um, okay, so one of the things I wanted to quickly highlight is uh, that Jupyter is available um, on, uh, on the system and you can access it via Jupyter, the, the nurse Jupyter hub. Um, uh, it's kind of just similarly to, you would, to how you would uh, utilize it on, on Cori. Um, in terms of trying to make it, uh, the system as kind of usable for all of you as possible, we've, we've done a few things. So one is to try to make sure that Perlmutter supports all major programming models and languages for GPUs is something that I sort of highlighted already. Another is to make sure that we have existing uh, applications that we know the community uses um, pre-installed and optimized for the GPUs on the system already. So for example, if you're a VASP user, we have GPU optimized VASP um, installed and ready to go as long as you have a, have a, have a VASP license. Um, and we've put together a lot of information on um, using Perlmutter in our, doc, in our docs pages. So if you haven't already, make sure you kind of check out the Perlmutter docs at docs.nurse.gov. Um, I've talked a little bit about the tools and I just want to highlight once again, how valuable I think the, these hackathons can be. So if you're a person who's working on developing an application and want, and want to make sure it runs well, on Perlmutter, I think that these GPU hackathons are a really great opportunity to work with us and work with the vendor, uh, uh, NVIDIA, for example, to, to make sure that these um, your code is running as, as, as well as it possibly can. Um, <clears throat> I, I mentioned this earlier, but we did work closely with NVIDIA to make sure that OpenMP 4.5 and 5.x support has been enabled uh, on the system through the NVIDIA compiler. Um, so this, this work is essentially ready to be used by anyone. You can now program to the GPUs using OpenMP as your programming model of choice and using the NVIDIA compilers to, um, uh, to, to compile and run your application. Um, okay, so I want to kind of close here with a few science examples. Um, so one uh, that I want to start with is sort of one that's kind of near and dear to my heart. This is an application that I've worked on for, for many years. Um, so this is a material science code. It's called Berkeley GW. And what it does is it kind of analyzes the excited states of a system. Um, and in particular, this application was looking at uh, sort of defect states and materials. So in this particular case, there's sort of a, um, a defect in this pure silicon crystal sort of at the center of the diagram here um, that uh, causes sort of localized states or states that um, kind of quantum states that are sort of centered on that defect. Um, and uh, these are kind of challenging calculations because in order to study a defect, you kind of have to have a large, um, a large uh, sample of the material in order to kind of capture these, these complex states. Um, and so these are some of the largest calculations ever done to date. And um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about the performance here. So we are comparing the performance of V100s like 
exist on the summit system at Oak Ridge compared to the A100s that exist here now at NERSC. And you can see um, some uh, significant performance advantages in terms of times of solution. So here lower, lower is better as you're moving towards that newer GPU architecture. Um, and uh, the ability of the application to scale to the, to the near um, full Perlmutter system. Um, another science example comes from the exabiome space, uh, or the bioinformatics space, I should say. So exabiome is a particular kind of application in the space that deals with metagenomics or kind of resolving um, uh, and um, identifying organisms from a sample that you would get from like a real world environment where you end up with many different microbes present at the same at the same time. Um, this is a challenging problem to uh, to GPU accelerate, but they made ended up making quite a lot of progress and um, have uh, written and deployed the world's fastest uh, GPU aligner um, targeting specifically the A100 GPUs. And uh, here's some of the performance increase you can see. So if you're looking at the time to solution, uh, again, lower is better running on uh, the CPUs of, of Perlmutter versus GPUs, you can see some significant um, increase, uh, even up to very large node counts by using the the GPUs of the of the system. Um, here's an example that comes from the computational fluid dynamics or CFD case. Um, and this kind of represents a trend that we're beginning to see in our user applications where there's a combination of traditional simulation and modeling with uh, AI or deep deep learning type methods. And so what they've done here is um, uh, put together a, a traditional computational fluid dynamic solver where you kind of time step uh, through a, uh, a fluid dynamic simulation. Oh. But in the middle, they're using um, a neural network to basically upscale or kind of get a super resolution view of the, of the fluid. And the idea here is to get the um, fidelity or accuracy of a finer mesh calculation for the kind of cost of a uh, kind of reduced order or uh, coarser grained calculation. And um, in particular, the GPUs are uh, used both at simulation time, but as well as training time to train that neural network. Um, and uh, the GPUs are many orders of magnitude faster at that process than uh, the CPUs. And even um, compared to the late, the, the previous generation GPUs, the V100 GPUs um, that are on, um, you know, our test bed in Cori, as well as Summit, the, the newer GPUs are two or, two or three times faster at that training step than the previous uh, the previous generation, um, and so I think I'll give maybe one more science example here, which is a um, uh, molecular dynamics calculation um, that uh, a team um, put together to run on Perlmutter. And so what I think is really one of the really exciting aspects of this calculation is that this team realized that they can use lower floating point precision. So either six, you know, I guess this mixed 16, 32 bit precision to run on Perlmutter. And by using that lower precision, they're able to break the exaflop barrier um, exceeding one, 1 1.1 exaflops at the lower at the lower precision running at uh, essentially full scale or ne near full scale on the, on the GPUs. Um, 
So they were like, this was sort of like a COVID uh, specific uh, application um, with 83 million, 83 million atoms and taking advantage of the tensor core capability of the, of the processors. Um, so I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit um, and um, talk about one last set of, of applications and then I'll close the, the presentation here. So this final set of applications is something I wanna highlight because it uh, shows another sort of trend towards usage of the nurse systems that we've been seeing over the last few years, which is collaborations with other uh, DOE facilities, um, in particular facilities like Light Sources. So this is from the LCLS at Stanford, NSEM in, for electron microscopy, as well as um, high energy physics uh, like LZ and the DESI uh, experiments um, in uh, the high energy physics and kind of astrophysics domains. Um, and all of these uh, applications are now kind of up and running on, on Perlmutter and producing um, science results that they really couldn't have um, without the, the kind of scale and capability of the Perlmutter system. Um, to highlight one in particular, if we look at the DESI project, <clears throat> um, they are seeing uh, over two and a half X improvements in per node throughput uh, using these, the, the newer Perlmutter GPUs compared to the, the GPUs that they had access to on Cori. And if you compare it to Edison, um, going back to that sort of, sort of CPU only system, uh, over a 25X improvement uh, on a node per node basis. And so I will kind of conclude here with these, with these science stories and um, hope that uh, some of these have been uh, kind of inspiring about what, uh, what you can do with Perlmutter as well. And we are, you know, I just want to close and say that we, I think we are really, really excited to see what you all do with Perlmutter over the life of the system. We're really excited about the science and the discovery that's going to be done with the, with the Perlmutter system during its lifetime. And I think I will stop sharing and um, just a reminder to put all, to put any questions you have into the Google doc and we will, I think, reply in the Google Doc.